good afternoon and welcome to the Committee for Justice's virtual panel discussion, Agency Independence, Presidential Power, and Seal of Law versus CFPB. I am your host, Ashley Baker, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. Today we have with us some exciting panelists who will have a very interesting expert insight on the Supreme Court decision. I will now introduce our panelists in the order in which they will. Adam White is a resident scholar of the American Enterprise Institute and an assistant professor at George Mason University's Anton Scalia School of Law, where he directs the Steve Winning Gray Center for the Study of Administration. In 2012, he was part of the team that filled the, filed the original constitutional lawsuit challenging the CIA. Elia Shapiro is the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato and publisher of the Cato before joining Cato, he was a special assistant and advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues and practiced at Patton Boggs and Clary Goddard. Shapiro is co-author of Religious Liberties for Corporations, Hobby Lobby, the Affordable Care Act, and the Constitution, and editor of 11 volumes of the Cato Supreme Court. He has contributed to a variety of academic, popular, and professional publications and regularly provides commentary for various media. Shapiro has testified before Congress and state legislatures and has filed more than 300 amicus. Bo Brunson is the Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Consumers Research and leads the Consumers Research engagement on legislation and regulation. His work includes research on financial products, public interest comments on modernizing banking and energy regulation, and numerous consumer-focused editorials on issues pertaining to consumer protection, financial services, technology, and copyright issues. Prior to consumers' research, he served as deputy staff and legislative director for a member of Congress serving on the House Committee on Financial Services and chairman's designee to the House Committee on Space, Science, and Technology Subcommittee on Finance. Um, a few housekeeping um, notes for if you want to send a question during our Q&A portion, please send it to me directly through the Q&A portion on Zoom. You can send me those questions at any point throughout the panel, and I'm going to weave those in towards the end of our discussion segment. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so with that, um, Adam, the floor is yours. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. In this case, I think this week's decision was a, was a great win for the Constitution and an important case. Let me just, I'm, I'll set the table for the, the case and then turn over to Ilya. Just by way of background, you know, if you go back in time a decade to when the CFPB first started to propose, I mean, it's fascinating to go back to those early articles then Professor Elizabeth Warren, and see how mundane the agency was supposed to be. She originally proposed a, she modeled the, the, the CFPB on the Consumer Product Safety Commission, a multi-member, five-person bipartisan commission um, that would regulate consumer finance. And in other writing, she warned um, that it would be important for this agency to sort of set rules in advance, not use enforcement or adjudication as a hammer for making uh, law on a case-by-case -case basis. It was really sort of a, a mundane, sleepy uh, agency. One can, you know, criticize whether the federal government needed to play that role at all, whether it was better left than the state. One can question whether independent agencies are ever a good thing. Um, but as far as things generally go, the originally proposed CFPB was basically going to be the next, uh, you know, CFTC. Well, and by the time that Dodd-Frank was actually enacted, of course, it got turbocharged. They got rid of the multi-member commission structure, made it just one director. They gave it an immense sort of independent sort of funding rather than going to Congress. Um, with Congress power of the purse rather than not working with the president's budgetary uh, role. They just gave the CFPB a blank check every year, hundreds of millions of dollars in the Federal Reserve. Um, and then there were a variety of other sort of small little features, all intended to make this really the most independent agency that we've seen. At the same time, the agency would have basically open-ended regulatory power. There are a couple other novel things that were thrown in, some ways in which another new body, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, would have a role But this thing really was unprecedented. And so it left critics with real questions about how, if at all, to challenge it. Ashley kindly mentioned that I was involved in an early lawsuit, um, not the one that wound up going to the Supreme Court, not at all. Uh, we filed, when I was working with uh, Boyd and Gray, we and O'Melveny and Myers, CEI, filed a lawsuit on behalf of the West Community Bank um, that wound up getting dragged down to 
procedural uh, limbo. But in any event, the, when we were framing up the case, the real challenge was how to frame it, because you had this unprecedented combination of features that really put it beyond the bounds of anything the court had ever proved. But there wasn't an obvious box to put it in. We thought about the non-delegation aspects. So we thought about Congress's power of the purse. We thought about the multi-member commission structure. Ultimately, our own case was framed in terms of sort of a mosaic theory. Put all these pieces together, it goes beyond anything the Supreme Court had ever signed off. Our hope for that, and ultimately the hope of the Supreme Court decision, was the fact that right before Dodd-Frank passed, the Supreme Court drew a dotted line around uh, in current independent agency. In the case of free enterprise, the challenge to Sarbanes-Oxley's independent agency within in the Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court basically said that the Supreme Court had signed off on some limited exceptions to the usual rule of presidential control of agency. And the court wasn't going to allow any further creativity beyond that document. Um, and so that was always, I think, in our case, in the PHH case, as Ted Olson argued, and then in the ultimately successful CELA law case, another case called Morgan Brown, we kept focusing on the combination of factors. Uh, combination structure fact it really was beyond anything the court had ever affirmed. That strategy didn't require the courts to go back to first principle to allow just ask the court to enforce the limited lines that were already. Um, CFPB, in the meantime, I'll just wrap on this. It really did prove its critics right at every point along the way. Uh, when Richard Cordray got his initial recess appointment and went on a flurry of public speaking and regulatory action. He told a member of Congress in a hearing that it wasn't any of their business how the CFPB was spending immense sums of money on its own, uh, its own building. He said in another hearing, the CFPB would not try to define broad statutory terms in advance of the enforcement. It would just sort of make up these interpretations as it went on a case-by-case basis. Cordray said he didn't think it would be helpful for the agency to make these decisions in advance. Helpful to whom? Well, helpful to the CFPB. Um, elsewhere, in other hearings, he said the CFPB had broad power to waive statutes, that were other statutes that were in the CFPB's regulation, and on and on. The early CFPB really was a perfect case study in why uh, accountability and structure is important. And I think that really helped lay the groundwork for the lawsuits that ultimately succeeded in pulling back. So maybe with that, I'll turn it over to Ilya. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, this case involves a law firm that advised various clients on consumer finance uh, issues. There was an investigative demand that the CFPB issued about some of its practices. And in response, uh, part of the sale of law challenged the constitutionality of the structure. Uh, ultimately losing before the uh, the Ninth Circuit, but the Supreme Court 5-4 ruling overturned uh, or reversed that, that ruling, holding that the structure of the CFPB violates the separation of power, but that the CFPB director removal protection is severable from the other statutory provisions bearing on CFPB authority. The agency may therefore continue to operate, but its director must be removable by the president's will, quoting the director from the opinion. So. That's an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, uh, joined at least uh, in the judgment by uh, four, by the other four Republican appointees, or at least in the judgment that seems to be structured unconstitutional. Um, uh, only Alito and Kavanaugh uh, agreed with the Chief that the removal protection is severable. Uh, the, the dissenters, the, the Democratic appointees, uh, also uh, agreed with that uh, grudgingly. We got half a look in that regard. Justice Thomas and Gorsuch would have overruled uh, Humphrey's executor, which I'll go in a moment, and uh, feuded also the severability doctrine together. Would have gone both more broad in terms of overturning the executor and more narrow in terms of the remedy is just uh, not uh, forcing the investigative demand. So, um, what uh, the Still, the plurality opinion uh, was holding, or I guess the, the majority at this point before we get to separability. Uh, while we do need not and do not revisit our prior decisions allowing to take on president's removal power, there are compelling reasons not to 
extend those precedents to the novel content in led by the director. That is, as Adam was describing, the other independent agencies were different in various ways. They were totally independent, but they were multi-member, or they were a single uh, director, but not fully independent. The scope of their uh, rulemaking power wasn't quite as fully discretionary as the uh, In short, uh, back to Robert's opinion, Humphrey's executor permitted Congress to give for cause removal protection to a multi member body of experts balanced along party lines, formed a uh, legislative function, and was said not to exercise executive power. But uh, uh, page 23 of the uh, slip, the resulting constitutional strategy is straightforward divide power everywhere except for the presidency and render the president directly accountable to the people through regular election. In that scheme, Individual uh, executive officials will still wield significant authority, but that authority remains subject to the ongoing supervision and control of the elected president. The CFPB's single director structure contravenes this carefully calibrated system by vesting significant government power in the hands of a single individual accountable to no one. The director is neither elected by the people nor meaningfully controlled by someone who is. The director does not even depend on Congress for annual appropriations. Side. I think that's a very important point. Kind of, uh, you know, we talk about the bureaucracy being fourth branch of government, essentially fifth or a sixth. So, uh, once it was created, it's a, it's a, a perpetual motion. So, anyway, Roberts continues the director may unilaterally, without meaningful supervision, issue final regulations, oversee adjudication, set enforcement priorities, initiate prosecution, and determine what penalty to impose private party. With no colleague Swayed and no boss or electorate looking over her shoulder, the director may dictate and enforce policy for a vital segment of the economy, affecting millions of Americans. Uh, and therefore, um, the removal protection is enough to render the agency structure uh, unconstitutional, uh, but the five year term and receiving funds through the Fed, not appropriation process, makes it even worse. Um, as Robert uh, includes that section. President's removal power is the rule, not the exception. Uh, the court uh, rejected the argument interpreted to give the president substantial discretion. So um, at that point, Thomas and Gorsuch peel off. Uh, Roberts, Alito, Kavanaugh go on to say that there is severability thinking about what would Congress that passed God Frank prefer? Uh, uh, no agency at all, or the, the agency that they created, but with removal is not quite as independent as they wanted because, as the court described, that measure of independence is not allowed. You can't create a new uh, branch of government. Uh, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch uh, occurred in part, dissented in part. First, they said that Humphrey's executor, which allowed these independent uh, multi-member uh, said that Humphrey should be overruled. Uh, the decision, quote, poses a direct threat to our structure and as a result, the liberty of Congress has increasingly shifted executive power to a de facto fourth branch of government independent agencies, and our tolerance of it is a fortunate example of court failure to apply. He goes on to say later on, uh, quoting or, or citing uh, the important precedent that we've had in this area the last 25, 30 years, more than Olson, the Enterprise Fund, uh, involved the uh, Sarbanes Oxford created the oversight board. Now, in this case, the foundation for home executor is not shaky. Severability. Thomas disagrees with uh, doing that uh, the way that the plurality joined effectively by the did, uh, because it means the courts are revising and rewriting statutes to just refuse to enforce any of the uh, agency's uh, demands or actions Congress uh, handle the rest. Briefly, in dissent, uh, written by Justice Kagan, uh, with all three of the other uh, more liberal justices joining, first uh, says that on constitutional text, history, precedent, structure, and policy, um, the president uh, has zones of administrative independence, limiting the president's removal power. Uh, the president, in effect, has more, not less control when there's a single head director rather than multi-member. So, you know, the 
CFPB under this ruling is less problematic than, say, the SEC uh, or the CFTC, as, as Adam was describing, or the CPSC, all the, the alphabet uh, agents. Separation of powers is, quote, by design, neither rigid nor complete. Uh, and so the CFPB is not unconstitutional, even though it's novel. Novelty is not the proper test. Congress regulates in that sphere under the necessary proper clause, and given the modern challenges of the modern economy and the issues faced in the uh, financial crisis, this is a uh, totally understandable, necessary, and proper uh, result. So uh, I'll end with that, and I'm happy to talk further about what I think the consequences of this might be for other agencies or the Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for uh, allowing me to come on. Um, I, I'm going to take a different tactic. I'm, I'm not a, a constitutional lawyer by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and so I'm going to stay out of that field, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what this means for consumers. Um, kind of some, something that I think is often lost uh, in the discussion of the CFPB is uh, what, what was the world like when it was passed? You know, coming out of financial crisis, um, and you know some sort of desire for overwhelming consumer protection um and i kind of i like to mark this because uh you know dodd frank passed cfpb created uh july 21st 2010. three days later the iphone 4g was released um and i think that's significant because the iphone 4g was really the first place where consumers uh, we're no longer going to have to go to their bank. And so in three days after the passage of Dodd-Frank, the entirety of consumer banking changed. Um, we didn't know it yet, but now, you know, eight years, 10 years, 10 years later, um, that's, that's where we are. Consumers bank in their pocket. Um, consumers don't have to go and talk to their bank. Uh, things move a lot faster. And so here you have this agency that has basically been given Supreme power over consumer financial protection uh, that was drafted by le uh, through legislation that um, doesn't exist uh, in the modern era, or basically a consumer protection regime that doesn't exist now. And so one of the, the reasons that um, I felt like it was really important to stake this claim, this the law case, was that um, if you had a, 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 a single director over the course of the entirety of a president administration not aligned with parties, the shit couldn't occur. Um, and so innovations change, other things like that would boost consumer consumer access change. Um, the, the director would have to change it. In, 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 in. And so uh, here you have the single director funded by the Fed, completely, totally independent. Um, and and what did, what did the, the original director do? He did set out to do exactly what he said and tried to turn the whole world on its head. Um, and you have a new new president turn over, the director hang, uh, the, the director there uh, basically sits and um, over the course of the first year of the, the next administration continues to, to focus his views on consumers rather than and So in that sense, it's good for consumers because consumers have a voice in the say of the policy uh, in, the, in the case of an um, a new director comes in and there's a change in philosophy. Uh, there's a rollback of the arbitration rule. There's a rollback of uh, payday rule or at least attempt uh, creation of new, a new innovation. Um, and so I think where we are now is with a administrator that is, administrator that is answerable, um, there is an opportunity uh, for consumers to weigh in a little bit more um, and, and a point that maybe didn't exist. You basically had the CFPB, they were gonna do what they were gonna do regardless of what consumer sentiment. Um, you almost had a, um, a consumer financial Politburo rather than a consumer financial tax. Um, and I think that, um, that, that that's gonna change in the short run. In the long run, uh, we're in, some ways we're exactly where we are now or where we were before. Um, and I think that's un unfortunate. Um, you know, Mulvaney, when he became the acting director, he said the CFPB is here to stay. And so the goal from here on out is to make the CFPB work forever. 
Um, so how do we do that? Well, with the funding structure still the way it is and the leadership structure still the way it is, um, there is no push and pull with Congress. Uh, and every member of Congress represents hundreds of thousands of people. And so, yes, you have these supporters of the president that are represented, but the other half really have minimal support. Uh, the director has to come to Congress and uh, give give each house of Congress a, a talk, a meeting, two times a year, doesn't have to answer. Um, it was very frustrating when I was a staffer with the, the first draft. Um, even if we weren't being combative, we were trying to work with the director. Um, he, didn't, he didn't do that, and he, and he wouldn't. You know, I was there when he said uh, in the room, when, 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 when Richard Cordray said, uh, it's none of your business how our uh, how we're spending our money on our bill. Um, that's a problem. Uh, and that continues to be. It. And so I think that the next step need to be one, put the put CFPB on, on the appropriate. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, I'm going to use a, a, a metaphor uh, from Parks and Rec, but the director of the CFPB be the Mona Lisa Saperstein of uh, CF, of uh, uh, agency directors, he just sticks their hands out and says, "Money, please. Um, and 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 the Fed has to, and, and that's pro that's problematic. When, during the budget process, staff from the agencies go and they sit in front of Congress and they argue back and forth. With staff and the and, and 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 the staff and the members of Congress hash out things. Uh, agency regulation isn't going the way that uh, one party wants. There's a lot more opportunity." For consumer feedback. Um, and so I think that's important uh, because the way that it's funded right now, um, that, that doesn't have to occur in one. Um, the other thing, you know, we talk about uh, bipartisan leadership structure. Um, as long as the world exists um, the way it does today, uh, unless there's another Supreme Court ruling, um, I, I think you look at the other agencies, the FTCs, the FTCs, the CFTCs, um, there is a lack of leadership vacuum. Um, or sorry, there there is there is no leadership vacuum in those when there's a change in political. Everybody stays working, um, you know, and, and so there's an opportunity for number one for when there's a change in things work. But number two, uh, there's an opportunity for more uh, discourse on on regulation, and I think that's important. Um, you think about it. When Mulvaney came into power, the CFPB just stopped. And basically the same thing happened when Craniger came. The CFPB stopped again, and they were from the same political party. And so stopping this organization is meant to protect consumers, regardless of the law. Um, when that just stops on a dime, uh, that's problematic. Um, and so I think in the sense that if you want some sort of continuity, you don't have the same sort of leadership value. Um, a bipartisan, uh, a, bi a bipartisan board. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that, uh, what we do in the future going forward. Um, and, and thank you again. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I mean, the first question for our panelists as we start the discussion, I, mean, I think it would make sense to talk a little bit about um, the other litigation and what could potentially happen in the court. There's a lot out there. There's still the lingering question of the fact that the CFPB is funded by the Federal Reserve. And I also think, you know, we have at least three, I saw three justices on the court who would very much like to grant another attention should it come up, um, you know, within the next couple of years. Um, where do you, you all see this going? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I know there's at least one lawsuit out there um, challenging the funding structure. I think it might be by Phil Hamburger. CLA. Um, so that's out there. I'd say looking at this case, and I have a piece coming out about this probably, uh, probably come out next week, um, today, about the way the what this court what this court's opinion does around where it lays. A couple of paths to take towards further along. The first and most obvious is continue is, is direct rollback of the two main precedents at issue, Morrison v. In the opinion, we saw it where Thomas and Gorsuch. We saw a real interest in rolling both of those back, getting rid of them, just restoring all federal aid. 
Kavanaugh didn't join that opinion, but he has said elsewhere, he said when he was in the circuit for a candid interview um, at AEI, where I now work, he said um, that he'd love to put the, the final nail in the coffin of the deal. Now, this one of the great things about this case, the new case, is that it really imposes some structure on this confusing area. It, uh, it says there are two exceptions to the general rule of president. One, for inferior officers, there, could, there, there can be some statutory independence under uh, Morrison v. Old case. And then for heads of agency, independence has to be limited to these. Kavanaugh's focus on the Morrison point, less so on the Humphrey. And what's interesting is you could see the court, instead of going for a full rollback of agency independence, another course that's maybe finally see the ground to roll things back to Humphrey's executive, which is to say, and the, the line here, the way that the court describes Humphrey's executive president is um, uh, this exception to general presidential control from multi-member expert agencies that do not wield substantial executive power. Now, Humphrey's case almost a century ago was the And Elena Kagan in her dissent here says, well, the FTC, that's, this is a rewriting of history. The FTC has always what looks like executive power, power. Roberts and the majority say, well, take that case on faith. In that case, the whole reason why the court upheld the infrastructure uh, for the FTC was that they didn't see it as an executive body. In fact, they said it was charged with no executive power other than administering policy. The past is a foreign. If you go back to the era of, of Humphrey executor beforehand, these independent commissions were really seen as adjuncts to or replacements for different courts. The whole point behind the Interstate Commerce Commission, the FTC, and the other early multi member commissions. FDR tried to reframe them as executive power, and we now think of them. But before Humphrey's executive, the whole reason why these things were allowed to happen was because uh, they weren't seen as wielding any executive. So that's the other path the Roberts Court might take for, might take if they want to move forward with further reform. It's to roll back uh, independent agency powers that are executive, right? So things like enforcement power, especially. You can see the court after SELA saying, no, independent commissions can't have those powers to retain their independence. That's quintessential executive power that has to be in control. Um, there's always been debates in the administrative law community over what's called the split enforcement model, which is where one independent commission just makes the policy and adjudicates cases, um, and then another agency actually brings it forward. So some things in the seal of law that might give a foothold for litigants who want to bring things in that, that direction. Narrow, targeted strike at the most quintessentially executive aspect of independent agencies' modern power pull those things back. Obviously, that's not the, I think that's not where the energy of the conservative and libertarian legal movement is. Um, the, the zeitgeist really is getting rid of independent agencies altogether, and maybe that's where the court will end up. But I would focus people's attention on this opportunity for narrower reform, focusing on specific aspects. I'm glad you went first, Adam, because that allowed me to check uh, on the status of Collins versus Mnuchin. It's been so long since I think it was last, early last fall, the Fifth Circuit on bond uh, did, uh, well, said that there were serious constitutional problems with the FHFA, the uh, Federal Housing, Fair, Fair Housing Federal, I, I, don't, I don't remember what all these things stand for. But anyway, uh, Mark Calabria, my former colleague, is, is now the director of it. Uh, and there was a split of authority among the, uh, basically a conservatives versus liberals opinion, but a split of authority on severability, things like that. Across the Shirt have been pending for January. Presumably, now what the court's going to do is uh, grant vacant and remand for consideration in light of the sale of law. Slightly different structure in that age, slightly different budgeting. You know, I don't know whether that's significant for the constitutional terms that were raised in the sale of law, uh, but there are other agencies uh, that, that have not quite every jot and tittle of the expanded powers of the CFPB, but they structurally uh, do. You know, one other interesting thing that followed this case was 
Elizabeth Warren tweeted. Um, it was sort of a strange tweet. I'll probably write about it at some point. She said, the CFPB continues to be an independent agency. Their job is to get the tricks and traps out of credit cards, mortgages, et cetera. Nothing in the Supreme Court ruling changes that. It's really kind of a strange tweet because obviously on its face, the, the whole point of the case was the CFPB isn't. Also, classic Adam, that, White, classic Adam White to read a tweet on the paper. Okay. Um, <laughs> I print up all my emails, too. Um, but, uh, but no, what's interesting about that is I think what she's getting at is um, this is a shout-out to the bureaucracy of the CFPB, right? It's, it's not a dog whistle. It's a watchdog. Whistle. And it's a call to the bureaucracy of the CFPB to continue doing what they're going to do. Right? The most important independence regarding the CFPB was never really the independence the leadership of the president. This is between the bureaucracy, which Elizabeth Warren and others installed in the first instance, becomes rather self perpetuated um, and the political leadership. Only so much political leadership can do to really run an agency. It's true for almost all agencies, especially true for a young, sort of ideological, mission-oriented agency like the CFP. And so I think that's what Warren is getting at. I think what people really ought to pay attention to is the, 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 the independent within the agency. I think also, it's a good reminder to conservatives and libertarians, right? We're, we're, we're very much accustomed in, in our role to calls to, well, as Steve Bannon put it, deconstruct the administrative state, get rid of agencies, and so on. The most successful reforms are almost always constructed, not the right? Progressives building agencies like the CFPB. But on our side, on, on the conservative libertarian side, the greatest regulatory reform was the creation of OIRA um, as, as sort of an institutional check and balance against the other agency. And I think one of the important takeaways from this entire experience really is conservatives and parents ought to focus on constructing an unadministrative state, constructing institutions within government that serve, that are created for the precise purpose of checking the balance pro-regulatory side, right? Maybe a, a better version of a small business administration, other things like that. Ultimately, the CFPB is a success story for one, right? It's, gonna, it's not going um, and I think and Richard she, Cordray actually wrote a positive op-ed in the wall in the Washington Post about this decision, saying, yeah. hey, we, w once Biden becomes president, then he'll appoint, you know, someone like me again and we're off to the races again. Right. And so I, I think I think that really is sort of a it ought to be sort of a, a lesson for for us. That there's only so much you can do through litigation, to bring things down. And it is important. I mean, I've been in that business. Ilya's still in that business. Um, but I think Conservatives and libertarians really need to focus also on the construction side and, and learn from the CFPB. Um, I think it's interesting that you bring up OIRA, um, or good that you bring up OIRA, because uh, now that the uh, CFPB is not, uh, or at least answerable, answerable to the president, I think uh, you'll, you'll see a lot more OIRA involvement with the rules and regs. Um, and so I think that is an important oversight um, that the administration will have. Um, when Elizabeth Warren says, and this is back to my earlier point, when Elizabeth Warren says it's still an independent agency, it is definitely independent of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, again, I think that's a very big problem. Um, and, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's hard to conduct oversight uh, for Congress if they have uh, no, uh, no purse strings to pull. Um, you know, even the other bipartisan commission, all of them have some sort of uh, that they have to go and answer for what they're doing with the agency. CFPB has not. Um, Mulvaney said, and, and, and again, I was, I was as a former uh, congressional staffer on the Republican side, I was really excited for Mulvaney's first, uh, first uh, stint at, uh, at, the, uh, at uh, the committee. And that showing fraud it lasted all of about 10 minutes when I realized this is, this is terrible. It's bad governance, it's bad policy. Uh, and so I think uh, while it's good that you know more of the the the, uh, the presidential administration will be will be involved, uh, it is an independent agency in that it has nothing to answer for. If I can just ask Adam about that. put a lot on the table there, it sounds like almost uh, advocating a uh, second derivative to the state will multiplying OIRAs. Uh, my colleague Will Yateman. Cato has published a paper suggesting that congressional OIRA, lots more OIRA, lots more cost benefit analysis, and all this other stuff. Um, you know, so is it 
you know, it's kind of a ratchet effect. You counteract the, the ratchet. You kind of color the ratcheted color without scaling back. So ultimately, we just get more and more barnacle. I mean, at, at a certain point, wouldn't it be easier to, to deconstruct rather than to add more bureaus checking other bureaus? I wouldn't think of them as barn. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I, I think that, I mean, listen, there's a difference between uh, you and me, right? You're the, you're the, 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 the principled libertarian, and I'm sort of the warm door dealer. Uh, good government. Guy. I'm just a simple constitutional lawyer. I, I, I apply what I read on the te in the text. But all, all, all I'm saying is that, um, you know, that one of the geniuses of the, of the founding was that institutions matter, right? You need checks and balance. And there's sort of an asymmetry in the way conservatives and libertarians approach the annoying progressives. The progressives build institutions, they install them with sort of an expert class. It's really insulated in a variety of legal and practical ways, political oversight. And they just trust that that's going to last longer. I, mean, I shy away from the deep state um, term. I mean, sometimes they're not very deep at all. They're pretty shallow. Um, but I say there is something to be learned from that, right? That you create institutions. Tom Jones, Thomas once put it in an article before he's adjusted. You create good institutions that embody good value, and you allow those institutions to play a role in government. And whether it's you know OIRA, congressional OIRA, other things or inspectors general, what, what have you, I'd say look for opportunities to build institutions in the first place, really imbue them with mission personnel, um, I think is, is a practical lesson that we ought to learn. The, the you know, I saw, or, Ashley, can I make reference to this question in the queue about Robert Moses? So the, the Peter Winnett's question about the Robert Moses problem. I know can it's trendy. Can question, please? Oh, yeah. Or I'm, I don't mean to do your job. Um, I don't mean to jump to here. Um, Peter Wynn points out that the disconnect with the appropriation process parallels the Robert Moses problem. Robert Moses is a famous uh, infrastructure uh, czar in New York. Moses was appointed and in theory could be removed by the mayor, but his ability to self-fund allowed him to accrue so much power, uh, no one dared ever to try to remove him. Under our federal constitutional structure, the power of the person, key limit on executive power, is there any constitutional law addressing now, Ilya already pointed out, alluded to this, and, and, and so is Bo, and I think I have two. But funding is a total blind spot in administrative law, constitution of administrative law. It, it, and I think that we're going to see case law as progressives push this envelope so aggressively. I don't know about the CFPB case. The Supreme Court might decide that it's sort of said enough on, on maybe elsewhere. Um, we, we will see. Um, but on Moses, you know, I've heard that it's sort of trendy these days in the, the Zoom era, pundits to keep a copy of Moses's power, or uh, Robert Caro's Moses biography, the power broker on the shelf behind you. Well, I can one up all these people because I keep it in arm's reach here on my desk. Because I think the best he's looking for. Um, but I, I think that actually conservatives really ought to look back at the debate over Robert Moses. Um, the left seems to assume, oh, you keep witness? Uh, I'm comparing them. Um, I think the, the left sort of has this comfortable view of Moses that he was this, you know, corporatist figure um, who just quashed the little guy and who was out of control. But actually, Robert Moses was a, was a proud progressive and new dealer who came to New York, did what basically the CFPB and the EPA do today. They have a sort of an ideological mission. They have a vision of where they want to push the American people, but they think they think the people will eventually thank the board or would thank the board if, they, if the people understood rightly their own interests. And they just pushed forward with this really democratic and humane. And you see that sometimes in the CFPB where, where they tried to protect the little guy, but really in many ways made it very hard for the little guy. I mean, I saw this with my client in our own case, West Texas Community Bank, National Bank in the spring, and the CEO, Jim Stell who the CFPB's avalanche of regulatory red tape made it much harder for these people to serve the community in good faith the way that they want. Um, we see that in the positions of the EPA and Rust Belt communities elsewhere. And I, my point with all this is I think, I think the service and the can do well to really think about why it is that Robert Moses is developed and to point out to, or he's remembered, and to, and to really teach uh, the American people about 
the Robert Moses of our own, truly really are people like uh, Richard Cordray, some of the recent heads of the. You know, I am, uh, I'm, I'm going to touch base or, or, or uh, talk a little bit about uh, a wonderful Cato scholar that talked about uh, uh, the necessary uh, good that the, that the CFPB could do. Todd Zwick, um, <laughs> I know that's not, not really fair. He was at Mercatus. One of the things, if, if you realize that the, the CFPB is here to stay, then making it work properly is, is the only thing that's good for, for consumers. Um, you, you look at some of the uh, uh, regulations that they put. You talked about how you know, they, they're trying to help the little guy, but they end up hurting the little guy. Um, in the, the payday, um, because of the lack of uh, robust cost-benefit analysis, um, they were able to publish that uh, um, the the uh, consumers would lose uh, would lose seventy percent of, of availability of these loans. Give um, and they said that, that that's a benefit. Well, there's nowhere. This is the this is the bottom of the barrel. There's no there's no other the, the last the last regulated lending. There's nowhere else for them to go. But there is always a regulated. There is always a lender of last. Resort. It's just the first unregulated. Um, and so that doesn't help pushing pushing consumers down to loan sharks. It doesn't help the little guy. Uh, the arbitration rule, they buried it in a footnote that if the, uh, if the arbitration rule, rule were to pass, consumers, while there would be more money returned to consumers uh, as a group, individually, consumers would go from uh, receiving $5,400 in arbitration to $32 in class action loss. That's, that's, that's not good for the little guy either. Um, but these big regulations that make, make a the the uh, the powers that be feel good about themselves on protecting the little guy. Um, if you have a, a structure that that doesn't uh, force robust uh, and good analysis, um, then you're going to end up with more of. Them. And so I think creating uh, you know mini OIRAs or or uh, you know economic banks within each administration ends up producing better policy. Um, we're going some through some struggles with the FTC right now, but I think on a whole, you don't hear a lot about um, the terribleness of the FTC rules, at least historically, um, because you've got that army of economists in there that are like analyzing every single thing that comes out. And I, I think that's a good thing. I'll just associate myself with not been able to speak out about this case because although we, we do have back channel conversations because uh, he's on the advisory board now, maybe chairman, but, but anyway, he said that he'd be calling in after a faculty meeting right now. Todd, if you're on the line or Zoom, feel free to uh, pipe in with a question. I just realized I'm missing a faculty <laughs> Yeah, I, though I like that you bring up the anti-arbitration study, I thought that was one of the worst um, CFPB actions over the past, um, I think, 2015 or so. It was like 750 pages and mentions like 100 pages and that none of these went to trial. Um, are there any other, you know, examples of things the CFPB has done in a year ago that you would kind of highlight for Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that they've done since, um, and, and granted, to his credit, Cordray was the, was the mind behind the original version of it, Project Catalyst, um, which is basically a, uh, uh, you know, a first run at a, at a regulatory sandbox, um, gave, uh, gave Upstart an opportunity to do a little, a little bit more creative. Um, and so, you know, as far as, as far as uh, data for uh, uh, credit score, you know, whether or not a consumer is a good bet based on things like if they call their mom uh, regularly and talk more than 20 minutes, that, that is a good, a, a, an indicator of good. Um, you know, we have this, this, this thing, this, this giant amount of data that's out there on consumers. And, uh, you know, people are more than just their credit card and how, how, how much they pay the bill. Some people don't have. It. So that was his idea. And I think that was a kind of laid the groundwork for the current uh, compliance sandbox. Um, and that's one of the things that I think the CFPB could do and do well um, is offer, offer some additional creativity to, uh, 
technological product that could benefit the consumer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little old for this, but I have I have friends that have no no credit cards whatsoever. They they do all their payments through Venmo, um, and some of them can't get uh, cable contracts because they have basically no credit. Um, and so allowing some some creativity in the credit market, I think that's a good. Um, and that's something that uh, um, that the CFPB has done and, and is continuing to expand on that I think um, was was positive. Um, there's a lot of negative out there too. You know, you you send a an information request and all the wheels stop and the company is terrified and doesn't know how to answer. That's that's not positive. Um, you know, stuff can just hang out there forever. Um, and so I, I think more st- th- this particular case will allow for a little bit more um, wariness on the part of, of the director. But um, in, in general, I think there's still a lot. Can I point out two things that I think are particularly bad about the CFPB that I might not have gotten? Um, because I think they, they, they tell a broader story about the modern um, one was the CFPB's um, ability to repay rule on mortgage lending. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sort of ideologically opposed to regulation or federal regulation. But I will say, and this is one of the things I learned from my client at the time, the West Community Bank, the CFPB sort of approached this entire industry, including the community, with this sort of abstract mindset about, about Exclusive use of quantitative model to determine ability to repay. Totally unfamiliar with the whole notion of what our clients are to right? You might, uh, somebody comes in from your, your, from your community, you're serving that community, you know them, you know they might not be able to, on, on paper, they might not be able to make the number add up, but you're willing to make sort of a reasonable, I wouldn't say a bet, because the bank, community bank, betting, but you're willing to, 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 to move in favor of a loan it might not make sense strictly as a matter of numbers but because you know the person well um and the cfpb's initial rules made that almost impossible um and i thought it was an interesting mindset into this our our, our client was the head of the of the texas bankers association they met cord ray and invited him to come down or invited his team to come down and just see how these people do business and the cfpb bureaucrats said we don't need to come down to see your bank we know how banking works well they do in sort of an abstract democratic way, but not in a real way. And I thought that was an interesting window into so many problems are so endemic. The other issue that I, that I think didn't get enough attention was when the CFPB um, coordination with the Obama administration just started, really tried to put the squeeze on lenders for industries they didn't like, particularly the um, trying to leverage their sort of nebulous power in financial markets to act as a shadow regulator on other issues by saying, well, if you if you banks do business with, with gun dealers, gun manufacturers, you're really bringing in reputational risk. And it was total bootstrapping. What they were saying was, we're gonna we're gonna characterize these these industries as monstrous, and if you continue to do business, then you'll be seen as monstrous too. And that wouldn't be very safe and sound from a bank. I think that the CFPB's eagerness to really become a shadow regulator of these other industries showed how delicate and and, and and, and, and crucial, you know, um, oversight of these financial regulators really are. You see that with respect to CF, the SEC when there was pressure on the SEC to get more involved in political disclosure, politicized disclosure. This is an area that I think really deserves a lot more attention because to the extent that progressives feel dissatisfied with political policy, they're getting through direct regulation. They're going to lean ever more heavily on financial regulation. Financial regulation is always such a nebulous. Um, area of regulation to really indirectly control what they can. I, I think to talk about you're talking about Operation Choke Point, um, and the only reason that this really came to light was because the FDIC was also involved. Um, you know, had the FDIC not, not been involved, it might have lasted longer than we would have expected because there is no opportunity for additional oversight. Um, you know, the, the people that are at the CFPB. Um, at the time, were tight-lipped, and they were they were on on Team Richard Cordray, and you know there's no there's no whistleblower, and so in in some respects, consumers got got lucky across the board. They they were being leaned on. It wasn't just guns, 
payday lenders. It was basically any political, unfa- unfavorably political um, organization. Fire- fireworks of all things. It was there were, the, the laundry list was huge and just happened that the FDIC was also involved and that was what broke the dam. So do we have any more questions from the audience now that I can ask questions without my dog interrupting? Sorry about that. <laughs> Happens. Um, See, so do we have anything else in the Q and A? And if not, do we have any quite closing thoughts? Um, I'll I'll just say that uh, this was uh, pretty much what people were expecting. This conventional wisdom uh, result. Um, I was hoping for a little more uh, leading up to it. Uh, we got two votes against free executor, two votes against treating severability doctrine a little differently. Um, but that's, uh, that's, we say that sort of thing uh, with just about, about Gorsuch and Thomas across a whole uh, range of, of, of areas. So I don't know how much more movement there is going to be on structural challenges per se. So uh, forgetting kind of theoretical purity, um, Adam's uh, approach about uh, actually legislating solutions uh, has some practical um, uh, track to it. Well, I mean, in response to that, I would just add, or on top of that, that some of the most important reforms of administrative law that we've seen in the last two years have been, you know, small steps. They've been led by Chief Justice Roberts. The biggest rollback of Chevron deck was the front end of the TV program. It's made significant reforms to our deck. We've drawn lines around uh, Humphrey's executor and so on. Free Enterprise Fund and Nancy um, obviously, there are a lot of areas where I hope the court goes further. I think it should go further as a matter of first principle. But I think we really ought to celebrate the wins when they come. Um, these are significant um, efforts to really put a lot of old precedent, you know, in a tighter box and really put the, the burden on the defenders of the precedent to come up with principal justification for them. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to see at the very least, you know, step-by-step reform including maybe the ones I, I referred to earlier about taking away secure executive power from these multiple commissions um, by being really um, honest with the, the limits of Humphrey's executor as it was originally understood and not sort of blob over the 70 years. Or perhaps a reinvigoration of the non-delegation doc. For con- I would be. On, on on that note, it it is going to fall, fall to Congress, which uh, you know I, I I celebrate the win in the in, in the case, and, and and it did there were lots of good things in, there. Um, but to see Richard Cordray come out and spike the football afterward, um, you know that, that's that's concern uh, to me, and that, that just kind of really keyed up the fact that Congress isn't done with this agency, or at least shouldn't be. Um, I think uh, some reformers there was there was there was appetite for bipartisan reform. Um, on on both houses of both houses of Congress, um, you know, three years ago, um, that it evaporated um, because now it's like, oh, my my guy is going to be in charge again, um, and and I think that's problematic, and that's that's problematic for the agency, and and honestly for consumers, um, when when there's no when there's no uh, long term structure certainty uh, in a regulator, uh, there's a lack of innovation. Uh, consumers have less opportunity, um, and so I think does there should be concern. Okay, um, unless there are any more questions, I don't see any. I think that's about all we have for today. Um, thank you to our panelists for coming out. Um, for those of you who turn, tune in regularly or would like to next week, um, we're not sure about our topic next week, but it'll probably be something related to the remaining decisions. There are only a few left. There's an order, order stays on Monday, so we'll see what the court is down then. Um, and then we'll be having our webinar at as usual on Thursday. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great